Do you want to see a magic trick? This is the worst! <laughs> Welcome into the worst fantasy show. I am your host with the least, Jack Lucene. My voice still not a hundred percent, but it doesn't matter. I am here at six in the morning at the crack ass of dawn, Farmer John time, to bring you this week's fantasy football matchups for week two. <laughs> Smash that like and subscribe, but we will delay no further. We will start with the Thursday night football matchup, the Buffalo Bills at the Miami Dolphins. This is a 48 and a half over under, Uh, but suddenly we are very worried about the Miami Dolphins running backs. Uh, So obviously Raheem Mostert has already been declared out. Devon A. Shane, highly questionable with the short turnaround, may not play. If he is in, he will be in my lineups. Uh, But if he is out, then I, in very desperation plays, will play Jalen Wright. But I actually think the play is going to end up being Jeff Wilson. I don't think it's going to be a great play, but I think it's going to be a flex-worthy option. Uh, So Jeff Wilson, widely available. Even after waivers have run, uh, he's still available hanging out in a lot of leagues that I'm in. So you should be able to pick him up uh, if you are finding yourself in need of a desperation play. However, it is Thursday, so I would not necessarily be handcuffing myself to the idea of, oh, if I'm the Devon A. Shane owner, I must start Jeff Wilson or Jalen right here. Nah, nah. Like you should have startable assets on your bench, assuming how you know, depending how bench deep that bench is, Jesus Christ. Um, so I would be looking for other viable starting options uh, in deep leagues, though. If you have to directly replace uh, either Asian or Mostert, I I would prioritize Wilson slightly over Jalen Wright, though I do think Jalen Wright could have a good game here. Uh, as far as the receiving options, it's Tyreek Hill and Jalen Waddle, pretty easy. It's Tua Tonga Viola, and that's about it on the Dolphins side. As far as the Bills are concerned, Josh Allen, still very much Josh Allen. Uh, I think you're playing him. However, I'm not really into these receiving options. Dalton Kincaid, I think, is the only one that will end up being serviceable by the virtue of him being a tight end. Uh but I'm not trying to play Keon Coleman or any of the wide receivers here until I really see, I think Coleman eventually could have maybe start to emerge as a true number one in the offense more so than I expected, but I'm definitely not trying to play him on a Thursday night road game. Uh, For me, this is Josh Allen and James Cook and nothing else. And uh, with that, we can just move right into the Sunday matchups, starting with, Raiders at Ravens. We have an absolutely wild 41 and a half over under, so not expecting a high scoring game here. Uh, Lamar Jackson popped up on injury report. However, it was just some soreness apparently, and he is fine. He should definitely be playing in this game. However, I, I think this could end up being, you know, a little bit of a lower, like, I don't think they're going to have Lamar run as much as he did last week. I think we will see a little bit more Derrick Henry in this game. I have been pounding some Derrick Henry into my DFS lineups. Uh, I think the way that you beat the Raiders is by the run. Now, the interesting story that's developed since last week, obviously, Isaiah Likely, and whether or not you should play Mark Andrews in this game, or if you can go back to the well of Isaiah Likely. And I think for this game specifically, I would be trying to find a way to not play Mark Andrews, and I would play Isaiah Likely in my lineup. And the reason being that the Raiders' defense is pretty good. 
against the pass. I think if Max Crosby and the rest of that, uh, Christian Wilkins and the rest of that defensive line can just get after the quarterback, that's actually where the Raiders end up doing better. Where I feel like they struggle is just straight up against the run. And I think this could be a big Derrick Henry game, the Ravens' first game. Uh, the Ravens are going to be at home in this game, so it's their home opener, I believe, because uh, as far as I remember, they were on the road in Kansas City. Um, so I think this is definitely going to be a Ravens win and therefore a good game for Derrick Henry. I could see him having two touchdowns in this game, so I'm definitely playing him. Um, unless I have an elite option, I probably will fade Mark Andrews. Otherwise, he'll make it into my lineup. Uh, but I really like Isaiah Likely in this matchup, and I'm just fading the wide receivers in general uh, just because they're Ravens wide receivers. As far as the Raiders go, uh, it's Devontae Adams and nobody else. You cannot trust anyone in this offense right now. I was uh, – not that I was a huge Zemir White guy. Like, I definitely have a couple shares of him here and there. But even I was flabbergasted by the amount of usage that Alexander Madison saw in this offense and the fact that Antonio Pierce seems so willing uh, to be so flippant with the idea of his workhorse running back uh, definitely has me concerned. And I think the Ravens defense obviously is very good too. So this might be a game where Zamir White goes off on my bench, but I'm not going to you know, process over results sometimes, I wouldn't feel too upset about it. It would be a pretty bold call to leave him in, in the lineup after what he did last week. Uh, so for me, this is Devontae Adams and nobody else. Chargers at Panthers uh, with a stunning 38 and a half point over under, which somehow is still not the lowest of the week. In fact, it's not even the second lowest of the week. It is the third lowest of the week, which should tell you and prepare you to maybe um, temper expectations on the amount of fantasy points that will be scored uh, in the this first chunk of the NFL season. Uh, we saw last week historically scoring was down, field goals were up. I actually think we could see a lot more of that this week. Uh, starting with this matchup, Chargers at Panthers. I mean, you cannot start anyone on the Panthers right now. Even Deontay Johnson had, like, one gross reception, basically. Adam Thielen, honestly, was more relevant with, like, three for 60. Uh, like, the problem is with Xavier Leggett and Adam Thielen and Deontay Johnson kind of all working in unison – they're splitting such a gross amount of work from Bryce Young, who can barely make open reads and passes right now, that it's just not viable for fantasy. And obviously, Chuba Hubbard was supposed to be the guy while Jonathan Brooks is out. And yet he was out touched by Miles Sanders, who I think everybody overlooked and forgot was there, except shout out to my guy Disco at Big Draft Energy. He definitely was saying smash some. Miles Sanders shares late in best ball, and this is why. It's because I – and now I'm going to – the reason I'm pre-recording this episode is because I have an interview tonight uh, with Dennis Mickelson of the Science of Fantasy Football uh, website, so shout out to them. Uh, but one of the things that we're going to be discussing is that real-life football takes precedence over fantasy football. As crazy as that sounds, guys – you should always look at the game from a real football perspective as opposed to fantasy football because what happens is you almost develop like by uh, nature a pessimistic view of the game in a sense as opposed to a optimistic view of the game through the lens of fantasy football. Because in fantasy football, you're always trying to project like, oh, who's going to get points? Who's going to get points? And so there's a lot of wish casting that goes on on who's going to actually score points when in reality, if you look at it from a real football perspective, it's like, look, if a guy throws for 150 yards, you can't really split that between three wide receivers. You just can't. Um, you know, a lot of times the problems are a lot more basic in fantasy football than we make them out to be. 
so this is a long way of saying I'm not starting any Panthers this week. I really need to see how they look at home um, and if they still look like complete dog shit, and especially against a competent Chargers defense who I will be streaming. Um, as far as the Chargers go, I think Justin Herbert is startable based on what I saw from Derek Carr last week against this same team. Uh, I would be willing to play Lad McConkey, who I think, uh, shout out, uh, my guy Hoovtube, uh, already, um, you know, took a little bit of an early defeat in the uh, Lad McConkey versus JSN battle. He also uh, had Roma Dunes um, up against him, who is now dealing with his own injury. Uh, so that's TBD. But right now, Lad McConkey is looking like the truth. Uh, so I would start McConkey. I would start JK Two Legs. Uh, J if you don't know who that is, that's JK Dobbins. I still probably would start Gus Bus. This feels like if this gets away from them, Gus Bus could get an ugly touchdown. It's a bit of a deeper league play. I was never super enamored uh, with Gus Bus going at ADP. In fact, I took more shots on Dobbins late than I did on uh, Gus Bus in like that ninth, tenth round. But I do think uh, the Gus Bus could score here. So if you're in a deeper league, I don't hate it, but I would prioritize Dobbins above him. Um, for me, I feel comfortable with McConkey and Dobbins given the matchup and Justin Herbert. Uh, and I'm probably limiting myself to those three players. And even that feels like a lot. Uh, getting into one of my sneaky favorite matchups of the week, Saints at Cowboys. The Nolan Saints uh, looked a lot better last week than I think all of us were expecting. The Dallas Cowboys still look like the Dallas Cowboys. Uh, this matchup is in Dallas. It's a 46 and a half over under uh, i do think there's potential for this to go over i've been grabbing pieces um in this game however i have been very limited in what those pieces are i'm not gonna lie chris olave was extremely disappointed in week one i think you can go back to the well here even in a tougher matchup against the dallas cowboys simply because i think they're going to need him in order to win this game uh, the one play that I've been really hammering is Alvin Kamara. Regardless of game script, regardless of what's going on with this team, Alvin Kamara is going to be heavily involved. He is still extremely talented. He is still obviously an excellent pass catcher out of the backfield. So even if they are down, uh, he will still be getting work, um, especially if the pass rush is getting home early on Derek Carr, I would expect to see even a couple more dump offs uh, Kamara's way. So I'm very comfortable starting Kamara, kind of no matter what. Um, I think if you're in a super flex or like a really deep league, you can consider streaming Derek Carr here, but there's other options I would prefer. Uh, so for me, this is really Alvin Kamara, maybe Chris Olave, and that's it. Oh, and Taysom Hill. You can always take the lottery ticket on Taysom Hill week in, week out. It may not pay off. But when it doesn't pay off, it's like you're going to get the same production as most tight ends anyways. So like I kind of gross five points. And when it pops off, it's like now you're getting the game-breaking week from Taysom Hill. So he's a guy that if you drafted, he should just be in your lineup every week. Like you can't really predict the Taysom Hill games. You just kind of have to take your lumps uh, and then reap the benefits. And then on the flip side for the Cowboys, I mean, it's CeeDee Lamb, it's Dak Prescott. I would throw in a little bit of Brandon Cooks. I'm not fucking around with Schoonmacher. I like him. Not enough to put him in my lineup, uh, especially over plays like Colby Parkinson, who will be available in a lot of leagues. Ooh, excuse me. Um, but, yeah, for me, this is Dak Prescott, CeeDee Lamb, and a really gross Zeke play, and that's it. Moving right along, uh, Buccaneers at Lions. This is actually my favorite matchup of the entire week. I think Chris Godwin is a absolute slam dunk. Do you want to see me dunk? Sure. Yeah? Okay. Are you guys ready? I'm okay. Don't worry. Does that always happen? Yeah, I look at what Stafford and Cooper Cup just did to this Detroit Lions defense, cutting them up, especially out of the slot. 
and Chris Godwin coming off a game where he was eight for eight for 80 yards in a tutty. I have been grabbing as much Chris Godwin as humanly possible in my DFS lineups. I've been playing Mike Evans as well. I have a couple lineups where I literally put, uh, I grabbed Mike Evans and Chris Godwin. That's how confident I am in this game. It's a dome game. It's in Detroit. Uh, Detroit's defense, decent front seven, not so great in the back end. I think Baker Mayfield will be able to have a good game and take advantage here. Maybe not to the tune of four touchdowns, but I definitely expect him to have at least 250 and two, uh, maybe a little bit more even. Uh, so I'm playing. This is a this to me is the fire up everybody game. I'm playing Baker Mayfield. I'm playing Mike Evans. I'm playing Chris Godwin. I'm playing Rashad White in real deep leagues, like real deep. I'm talking like I got a 16 team dynasty league where you know people are looking for just viable starters. I might consider Kate Otten, but that's about the only way I'm stretching that far. Um, and Bucky Irving is not in my lineup. He, he is a great stash. He's someone I want on my roster right now. Um, so that's just someone that should be owned as a handcuff, uh, whether by the Rashad White team or others. And for the Lions, again, it's everybody's playing here. I'm putting Jared Goff. I'm putting uh, both Jameer Gibbs and David Montgomery, even though the Bucks are a pretty good run team. I you know, Gibbs gets more passing work. Montgomery is, you know, kind of their bell cow workhorse between uh, the tackles, lunch pail type of guy. Uh, so I think they're both viable week in and week out. Going right back to the well with Amon Ross St. Brown. Last week was a weird week, but it is what it is. You're playing Sam Laporta. I would even play Jamison Williams. Like, he might not have as uh, big of a game as he did last week, but at this point – you're going to just – Detroit's going to be one of those teams where week in and week out, I'm trying to get pieces of that offense into my lineup. Uh, moving on to one of the grosser games of the week, Colts at Packers, 41-point over-under. Uh, this sucks. This should have been a really interesting game, obviously, with Jordan Love. Uh, but, however, unfortunately, due to the Jordan Love injury, we are now stuck with Malik Willis. Go fuck yourself. So because of that, on the Packers side, uh, for me, this is Josh Jacobs and nobody else. I mean, in the deepest of deep leagues. Again, 16 teams higher maybe. If I have no other viable options, I would consider Jaden Reed only because they give him the manufactured touches. Like, you know, they'll give him some jet sweeps and that kind of stuff. In fact, he scored on a jet sweep last week. so. If there is a Green Bay wide receiver that I would start, it would be Jaden Reed, but there are going to be a lot of other options. Like, as gross as it sounds, Jaden Reed or Jacoby Myers, like, honestly, I think Jacoby Myers, I mean, I'll take Jaden Reed there for the upside swing, but it's like, they probably end up about the same. And that's really gross to say right now. Um, so on the Packers side for me, again, it's Josh Jacobs. And then, uh, and then for the Colts, Anthony Richardson, Michael Pittman, Jonathan Taylor, they're going to be in your lineup week in and week out. Uh, I think, obviously, Pittman, you know, uh, he had eight targets last week. The problem is <laughs> Anthony Richardson only completed nine passes, right? So if you only complete nine passes, I mean, you can't – again, math problems. How can you spread nine fucking passes across a team? So that's something that is concerning, but – we also saw um, a couple deep shots go down, Nai Mitchell uh, and uh, Alec Pierce. That could just as easily go to Michael Pittman uh, in a game or two. He is the most consistent wide receiver there, so you're probably just eating it and playing him most weeks. Uh, Anthony Richardson is a unicorn, so him, regardless, you can just put him in the lineup and not have to worry. Um, but I think Jonathan Taylor – and uh, Michael Pittman, there was always going to be some concern of how Anthony Richardson's game would affect theirs. But again, you're just you're playing them for the most part. So it's those three guys, Josh Jacobs, and we can move the fuck on. All right. Browns at Jaguars, uh, 41 and a half point over under here. Um, again, Deshaun Watson. 
looked horrendous last week, and that really throws a lot of the Browns into question. However, David Njoku now dealing with a high ankle sprain is going to be out three to four weeks. To me, that means that Amari Cooper is always in my lineup, kind of regardless, even last week, even though he only had two receptions, he had nine targets. At some point, those will convert into receptions, and at some point, if Deshaun Watson really can't get it together, Jameis Winston steps in and immediately this whole team receives like a, a fantasy boost, including Amari Cooper. Um, so I would, I'm still, I'm holding on to Amari Cooper. In Megalobowl, I had a lot of running backs. I have Derrick Henry, Saquon Barkley, Tony Pollard, and I drafted James Conner. Someone offered me uh, James Conner for Amari Cooper straight up. And I was pretty light at wide receiver. Uh, so I, I accepted that offer because, you know, just the perceived value of where Connor and Cooper were going in drafts and how it affect like how it worked for my team, like felt like I was getting a good deal. And obviously after week one, immediately regretting that like James Connor, you know, when he's healthy, which is always the caveat for James Connor uh, is always great. Um, but the problem is obviously, you know, I, I knew Deshaun Watson had struggles, but it just, it seems every time that we see him, it somehow becomes even more and more egregious that this man just like can't get through the basic mechanics of throwing the football. So, um, definitely has me a little bit worried, but I'm playing Amari Cooper this week. I think it's a bounce back week for him. Uh, and obviously no Njoku. Uh, I would play Jerry Judy as kind of a deeper option. Uh, Jerome Ford is going to be in my lineup. I'm not I'm not comfortable playing Deshaun Watson. If you drafted him in a super flex, you kind of don't have any choice. Uh, potentially, this is a better matchup, but I wouldn't feel great about it. On the Jaguars side, I'm hoping this is a bounce back performance uh, for Evan Ingram. I think... Uh, Christian Kirk is still viable. I think Brian Thomas Jr. already emerging as the true number one in this offense. The way that uh, Trevor Lawrence hit him in the back of the end zone, that play was crazy. Like where T-Law threw the ball and where Brian Thomas ended up actually catching it was like 10 yards apart. Like it, they, they already are developing a bit of a mind meld. And Brian Thomas Jr. with his uh, raw skills and athleticism is already emerging as like a true number one option for this offense. I think you can already start him as a flex option, like a viable wide receiver three. Uh, so I love Brian Thomas Jr. Loved him pre-draft, loved him during the draft process, going to the Jaguars with a huge opportunity. And Trevor Lawrence, a decent quarterback, like – uh, I drafted him on a lot, a lot of my teams. Brian Thomas Jr. is going to be one of my favorite uh, hits of the year um, if this continues throughout the season, and I do think that it will. So I'm playing Brian Thomas Jr. Travis Etienne, I mean, if Travis Etienne doesn't get the ball punched out right in front of the goal line, he has a much better fantasy day. Um, it was, and he still was half like pretty decent. I, I don't. I don't envision any scenario where Tank Bigsby is just taking over this job. It's just, again, this is real life football and fantasy football are, you know, coming ahead. And you're almost, it's like you're getting an earthquake because those two plates are colliding and they are cracking up against each other. Because in the NFL, in general, you need multiple running backs at this point in 2024 uh, to, to, to just survive the year. Like um, Travis Etienne is not going to get 400 touches. So I am completely unconcerned by Tank Bigsby, how good he looks, what he provides to this offense. They have two completely different skill sets in my eyes. Like Travis Etienne is obviously more of an electric pass catching big play kind of guy. And Tank Bigsby is more of your traditional three yards in a cloud of dust in between the tackles type of runner. Like, that's great. Those are two complementary pieces. That's Jameer Gibbs and David Montgomery. Like, those are two pieces that can absolutely coexist on the same football team and both be viable for fantasy football. So if I'm a Travis Etienne owner, I'm not concerned about Tank Bigsby at all. So Travis Etienne is going to be in my lineup every single week. 
Uh, and again, I'm hoping for the Evan Ingram bounce back here. I think Trevor Lawrence is startable. I mean, the Browns' defense is good, but historically is always worse on the road. And they always, you know, get into these weird shootouts year in and year out. It always feels like, oh, Browns' defense is so good. And the next thing you know, they're in like a 35 to 30 game on the road against some random team. So not saying that that's what's going to happen here, but I'm I'm just uh, I'm looking at Evan Ingram and I'm looking at the Browns defense kind of in the middle in terms of like their linebacker coverage, their safeties, their defensive backs like Ward probably ends up more often than not dealing with Brian Thomas Jr. You also have Christian Kirk to deal with. So it's like I think there's going to be space for Evan Ingram to operate. I am a really big Evan Ingram guy, so maybe that's my version of fantasy wish casting, but I would just getting back to it, Amari Cooper, deep release, Jerry Judy, Jerome Ford, they're all in my lineup. Uh, and then on the other side, Brian Thomas Jr., eh, Christian Kirk in deep release. Like, I see him literally kind of on the same as Jerry Judy's level pretty much. Uh, and then Travis Etienne, Trevor Lawrence over gross options. So, like, Trevor Lawrence over Geno Smith. Trevor Lawrence over Daniel Jones. Trevor Lawrence over even Aaron Rodgers, like, uh, you know, those types of cards, but like Matt Stafford, uh, Jared Geerf, um, Justin Fields, Jaden Day, I would start those guys over Trevor Lawrence. Um, all right, let's move it right along here. Uh, let's get one more matchup in before we take a quick little break. 49ers at vikings 45 and a half point over under um <laughs> obviously the christian mccaffrey uh injury uh you know came as a shock and a surprise again to people who do not watch football like have you not followed the nfl for the last hundred years Oh my God, the coaches lied to us about injuries. Yeah, they always fucking lie. That's what they do. Coaches are big, fat fucking liars. Like, I almost just, there's a reason it's called coach speak. Like, I almost won't even listen to coaches for the most part. Like, there's a couple tidbits here and there where I'm like, okay, th that might be worth something. But for the most part, like, when coaches talk, like, I just completely and abjectly just reject and ignore whatever the fuck they're saying to me it's like coaches are so easy because it's like show show me what you do on the field like i'll just i'm gonna go off your tendencies and how you actually manage games and the play calls that you make and like all of those things as opposed to you coming up on the podium and being like we're gonna really try to get this guy some work it's like okay that's nice of you to say that but it's like if you're fucking running two wide receiver sets trying to tell me that you're going to get the third wide receiver involved, like, go fuck yourself, all right? Like, so, yeah, this idea that Shanahan uh, didn't disclose the injury, and even the way that that would work anyways, it's like, it's so stupid because, again, it's like I, somehow this perceived advantage of, oh, they have to prepare for Christian McCaffrey, and they're not going to prepare for Jordan Mason, and that's such a big difference. Like, fuck off. Um, but anyways, so Christian McCaffrey obviously was seemingly lean, uh, leaning like he was going to play all week. Come Monday, uh, find out, actually, no, he's not playing. Jordan Mason's going to be the starter. And then after the game on the uh, post-field uh, press conference, which, again, is like, bro, Mason's still in his fucking pads, uh, like, as the adrenaline from the game going. Accidentally tells a reporter that the coaches told him that he would be starting on uh, Friday. And even that, the context of how he was told that, it's like, he could have, they could have literally said, hey, you know, uh, CMC, we, we have him tagged, is probably going to play. There is a chance that he doesn't, though, so make sure that you're prepared like the starter as if you were going to start on Monday. I want you to be in the mind of you are the starter. So if I, like, if I say that to you and then, like, without context and maybe in different wording, Mason, like I said, says, oh, yeah, I knew uh, Friday that uh, I might be starting or I would be starting. Like, again, 
not that that's what happened. I honestly believe that the Niners never intended on playing Christian McCaffrey and that this is the this is the same type of bullshit they do with quarterbacks where they're like, oh, the quarterback might play. And again, it's like this idea that like somehow you're forcing the defense to game plan for both or whatever. It's so fucking, honestly, it's, I think it's stupid. Um, but that's just a random tangent to get to the point of Christian McCaffrey, I don't think plays in this game. If you hold him out week one, there's no point in playing him on a road matchup against the Vikings in week two. So I do think we see Jordan Mason here again. I would play Jordan Mason. I would play George Kittle. I would play Debo Samuel. Um, now, the the longer he's playing, you know, the better Brandon Ayuk is just going to get throughout the season. So I would even play him. And I would play Brock Purdy. On the Viking side, Justin Jefferson, very obviously going to be in your lineup. Aaron Jones is a viable play. Even though the 49ers are a tough defense, Jones is able to get it done in the passing game, so I would play him. Sam Darnold looked way better than I was expecting. That's one of the things that I really have to eat crow on early in the season. Sam Darnold looked like an NFL quarterback, but it was a softer matchup. I really want to see, now granted they're at home, but I really want to see how Sam Darnold looks against this 49ers team. If he's, let's see if he can stay on schedule and uh, kind of complete at the rate and efficiency that he was doing last week against this 49ers defense. I still have my doubts and reservations to the point that I would not be starting Sam Darnold except over, again, the most dire of, quarterback situations again geno smith uh patriots quarterback will levis daniel Jones, like that kind of thing like you gotta really be in the bottom of the barrel to be like okay yeah start sam darnold uh but otherwise i'm limiting myself to those two players uh, justin jefferson and aaron jones all right we'll get through the rest of these matchups right after this 30 second dance party 30 second dance party <laughs> Oh, all right. Uh, we will go quick fire through these next three gross matchups Seahawks at Patriots, thirty seven and a half. Point over under. I am starting Ramondre Stevenson. End of list for the Patriots. I am starting Ooh, DK Metcalf through gritted teeth because I think Christian Gonzalez is a good defensive back and this could be a tough matchup for him. However, you start DK Metcalf every week. Um, I would not start JSN. I'm not starting JSN until I actually fucking see it happen at this point. Like, look, it, now we're in year two, different offense and everything. It's still the same crap. It's still Tyler Lockett soaking up all the targets. So until I actually see that change, Tyler Lockett I will put uh, as a deep flex play, uh, and then I'm playing Kenneth Walker, assuming that he's healthy. Moving uh, right uh, – oh, and I'm not playing Geno in this one if I can help it, just to be clear on that. Let's move it right along. Jets at Titans, 40-and-a-half point over under. Uh, Aaron Rodgers survived the game last week. That is probably the highlight of the Jets offense last week, uh, besides Brees Hall and Garrett Wilson early in the game. I think those are the only two pieces I would play on the Jets. It's Brees Hall, it's Garrett Wilson, and I'm done. Uh, Aaron Rodgers, again, I'm not trying to play Aaron Rodgers above most fantasy quarterbacks at this point. Like For me, like Aaron Rodgers or Baker Mayfield, that's an easy Baker Mayfield. Uh, Aaron Rodgers or Justin Herbert, I would play Justin Herbert. Like Aaron Rodgers or even... Jaden Daniels or Justin Fields, like, give me the rushing upside of the broken quarterback system. Like, uh, I'll, there's just not a lot of upside, I feel like, for Aaron Rodgers. Uh, and this Titans defense, I think, was a little bit better than I was even expecting. Now, granted, Caleb Williams and that Chicago offense didn't look the greatest. Um, but I also think the Jets are still trying to, like, find themselves and could have some struggles against this defense especially because they are a little better against the run. So if they're able to shut down Brees Hall and all of a sudden really 
force Aaron Rodgers to beat them. Uh, you know, outside of Garrett Wilson, the fact that Alan Lazard got so much work was a little bit disconcerting, to be honest. Uh, and then finally, for the one o'clock games, Giants at Commanders, 44 and a half point over under. This is a sneaky one. Uh, I like Malik Neighbors. I would play him. I would play Devin Singletary. Uh, I'm not going to play anybody else on the Giants. I think they can do better this week, but those are the two uh, pieces that I would be targeting to put in my lineup if I had them. And then on the commander's side, Terry McLaurin obviously got off to a very difficult start. I think this is a game where he will be more relevant and more involved. Uh, I really like Brian Robinson Jr. a lot in this game. Giants defense, uh, I think, is a little bit overrated. We saw especially... They were uh, taken advantage of last week. Uh, so I th I think the Manders run game can get going here. I think Austin Eckler might even be viable as like a deeper flex play. But I really like Brian Robinson Jr. to the point that I even threw him in a couple DFS lineups uh, because I think he can score a lot but also be a huge differentiator because I don't think a lot of people are going to be trying to get Brian Robinson Jr. this week. Um, so that's kind of a sneaky play for like your underdog daily lineups, uh, daily drafts, uh, if you're doing them on drafters or if you're just, you know, doing DFS, uh, salary lineups, uh, on DraftKings or some of these other sites. Um, so I really like Brian Robinson Jr. as a kind of deep target, but for me, this is Jaden Daniels as a smash in my lineup because of the rushing upside. I would play Terry McLaurin and I'm actively playing Brian Robinson Jr. All right, uh, the 4 o'clock games. We've got uh, Rams at Cardinals, which is the – it's funny because we really have two gems and then a complete fucking coal in your stocking dud. Uh, but we'll start with Rams at Cardinals, 48.5 point over under. This is a, a game where, again, I'm firing up everybody I've got. Um, Matt Stafford, Cooper Cup. Tyron Williams and Colby Parkinson, my favorite tight end sleeper. Uh, and that was pre-draft. And I also had him on my waiver list for this week. So if you didn't, if you missed out on Isaiah likely, you should have grabbed Colby Parkinson. I think he's going to see work here. Uh, and at, at worst is going to get like four or five receptions, I think. So he's solid for eight to 10 points, but with some uh, potential upside if he finds the end zone. Um, but yeah, I really like, all four of those options. So, again, Stafford, Cup, Kyron, and Parkinson. And I would even play, um, I think, Tyler Johnson and Demarcus Robinson are interesting. Tyler Johnson's been kind of taking more of, like, that Robert Woods role. So, it's, it's a little bit more depressed in value, even if it hits. So, if I'm going to take the chance on the tertiary option, for me, it's going to be Demarcus Robinson. I'm not forcing myself to do it, but if I have a spot in the lineup where I don't really like – the guy that's there, you know, if it's a Romeo Dobbs, for example, like I'll take the high upside of Demarcus Robinson because like he might not hit, but if he hits, it's going to be for 15 plus fantasy points because it'll be on a long play or two. Um, on the Cardinals side, I mean, obviously starting Kyler, uh, Kyler Murray, Trey McBride and James Conner, I think the real question mark and now at the news, uh, you know, Kyler Murray, a little bit of a diva answer. Oh, it's not my responsibility to uh, force the ball to Marvin Harrison Jr. Uh, I hate to break it to you, but actually that is, that's literally the definition of your fucking job as a quarterback is to pass the ball to the receiving options. Didn't know that, uh, I don't know if that's ever been explained to you. Maybe you were too busy playing fucking Call of Duty that day, Kyler Murray. Uh, but yeah, when you're a quarterback, you throw the ball to receivers. Isn't that fucking crazy how that works? So actually, your entire responsibility, your entire job relies on your ability to be able to pass the ball to your fucking generational number one overhaul draft pick wide receiver, Marvin Harrison Jr. Um, really, the problem, honestly, and I think this was lamented was the scheme and Kyler Murray's ability to read the field. There was one play where Marvin Harrison Jr. was wide open downfield for a potential touchdown, and Murray just missed the read. So, uh, I, again, that's a hilarious answer 
to me that indicates a little bit of diva and drama already in the Cardinals locker room and it's only fucking week one but given that this is such a high powered uh matchup and I think the coaches will take it on themselves potentially to maybe game plan a little bit more for Marvin Harrison Jr. here and I think the Rams defense is not what it used to be I would play MHJ in this game if you drafted him I mean he's you probably took him in the first or second round so you should be playing him but I think this is one where you can feel a little bit better about it. And if it doesn't hit this week, I would be hitting the fucking panic button because it's going to be one of those things where Marvin Harrison Jr. ends up being a player that was an abject bust for the person that drafted him, but ends up being, a, uh, I think, a league winner for the person that trades for him come week eight when that person's sick of holding him. Uh, so, yeah, that – Keep an eye on the on the MAJ managers in your leagues and see if there isn't an opportunity come week six to eight to trade for them. Uh, Bengals at Chiefs. I think this is a game that has me really nervous, but I'm also hoping can deliver. Um, historically speaking, this is one of the better rivalries in the Chiefs era um, when you talk about the Bengals uh, and the Chiefs, the way that these two teams generally play each other, very competitive. However, Joe Burrow's wrist, I was concerned about it pre-draft. People told me not to worry. Now I'm watching tape of this man struggling to pick up a fucking Gatorade bottle, and I'm back to worrying. I'm fully back on this idea of, like, the wrist injury was worse than people thought, and it's essentially going to require a lot of pain management throughout the season. And I can tell you, like, I've uh, on occasion, like, uh, I'll get like a weird kink in my wrist. Um, I don't know what it's from, but like, I I'll like work it out and shit. But like, when I get it, it's like literally the this motion right here, any kind of twisting motion, like you feel it's like a spike right in your wrist. So it's like the idea of doing this constantly. Which again, like I'm doing this, and you're like, what the fuck is that? It's like that's actually what a pat, like a quarterback's pass, really should look like. Is literally just a flick of the wrist, um, and so it is really like that, almost like turning motion of the wrist. So it's like he is definitely going to be dealing with that all year long. And then you take away his wide receivers. I mean, Jamar Chase, oh, I'm sick. He played. He had six for six, uh, but T. Higgins uh, wasn't there, so. We'll see if Chase and Higgins are in. If both of them are in, I would play Joe Burrow. If they are out again, even just one of them, I think I would look for alternate options. They would have to be really good alternate options. Um, like, a, again, going back to the Baker Mayfield well, I would play Baker Mayfield this week over Joe Burrow. I don't think that's crazy to say. You know, a, a plus matchup against Detroit – or a matchup against the Chiefs on the road, like give me Detroit. Um, and then the fact that you're you got Mike Evans, Chris Godwin, Rashad White, continuity, like and now I'm like, you know, Zach Moss is fine, Chase Brown is fine, but clearly they miss Joe Mixon. Um, for me on the Bengals side, if they're all in, I'll play Higgins and Chase and Burrow. Uh, if one or uh, if if Higgins misses again, I think I would play Chase and that's it. Um, and because it's like in that situation, Chase would need to have like 202 and then someone else has to step up to get like another 100 yards. And that's the only way Joe Burrow is going to be fantasy relevant. That seems like a bit of a stretch against this Chiefs defense. I'm betting this is a bad game for Burrow. So I would actually, like I said, I'd be looking for a pivot option for Burrow. Chase is just going to be in your lineup no matter what. Higgins, if he plays, he's in. And the running backs, just by nature of the beast, if you don't have a better option, I get it. But, I again, I'd be looking to pivot there too. On the Chiefs side, to me, this is fire up everybody. The Bengals defense is worse against the run than the pass, but they're still – I don't see a way that they're going to be able to stop the Chiefs here. Um, so I think Isaiah Pacheco I really like because, again, they are going to struggle against the run. I think they're going to be down are the Bengals, and so the Chiefs should lean on the run and therefore Pacheco. 
Um, but I also think this is a Travis Kelsey bounce back game. I like Rushy Rice in this game. And I like Xavier Worthy for a pot shot. And Mahomes is in my lineup every single week. Um, so, yeah, I'm playing all the Chiefs. And I'm playing Jamar Chase. And Higgins, if he does end up showing up. And here we get into the grossest matchup of the Sunday 4 o'clock games and also the lowest over-under of the entire week. Wouldn't you know it, my Pittsburgh Steelers are on the road against the Denver Broncos. It's a 36-and-a-half point over-under. Fucking wee-hoo, baby. I would play Najee Harris and George Pickens and Justin Fields. Um, Again, Fields is because... He's just going to run the shit out of the ball. It's going to give you a safe floor. If he finds the end zone, he's a viable quarterback. Um, so I, I play Justin Fields. Pickens is because he is our entire – like he is our whole receiving core. Now he's going to have a tough matchup against um, uh, – what's his face? Pat Sertain, the second. So I, I do think this could be a game where you have to temper your expectations against George Pickens. But I do think he could end up with like five for 80. So I wouldn't just take him out of my lineup unless I had a really good option. Like if I had George Pickens and Chris Godwin, for example, in a two wide receiver league, and I already have another wide receiver set uh, in stone. Like, you know, I have Amon Ross, St. Brown, Jamar Chase, Justin Jefferson, that type of guy who's already in my one slot. And then, you know, my other two wide receivers are uh, Chris Godwin and uh, George Pickens. That's totally possible. 100% would be playing Chris Godwin over him, not even close. Um, so, yeah. Uh, but it, Najee got 20 carries last week. Even if it, even when it's gross for Najee, he's going to be getting volume. I'm not playing Jalen Warren in this game. It really is for me fields. And, you know, Pat Firemuth, too, is like, it's just so low end. There's no ceiling there. This is really for me. This is, I'm playing Najee fields. And Pickens, and I'm not even feeling great about that. Uh, and then on the Broncos side, yeah, Javante looks washed, unfortunately. And now it's turned into a, a true three-headed monster where Javante, Audric Esteme, and Jaleel McLaughlin are all getting work on the field, which means none of them are viable. The wide receivers are generally like – terrible like they're getting a lot of work but it's awful like Devon Vale who's like a huge rookie uh and I say that I mean like physically he is a huge man um he had like eight receptions for like 35 yards Cortland Sutton had like uh 10 targets or some shit but it was like four gross receptions for like 30 Bo Nix is very much going to struggle in this game against this Steelers defense I have Steelers defense uh, they're usually owned, but <laughs> they will be played this week. Um, TJ Watt's going to murder Bo Nix. Uh, this is just unfortunate for the Broncos. I'm not playing any Broncos, to be perfectly honest. I am just like, man, I will be shocked if the Broncos can even find a way to score two touchdowns in this game. All right. Um, we can just move into the Sunday night football game. Bears at Texans. A little bit more of a, an uptick here. Uh, Bears uh, at Texans, 45 and a half point over under. Fire up everybody here. I'm, I'm liking all of my Texans. I'm playing Nico, Stephon Diggs, and Tank Dell and hoping it's my guy's week. Obviously, Joe Mixon, the clear workhorse, is in the lineup, and so is C.J. Stroud. Uh, Dalton Schultz is pretty irrelevant unless you're in like a 16-team or so. There's better options. Um, on the Bears side, I would not play Caleb Williams. After what I saw last week, uh, I'm gonna. I have Caleb Williams in a couple of places. Those places, though, I was very sure uh, and mindful to get a backup quarterback that I believe in. So a Matt Stafford, a Jared Goff, um, that type of quarterback where I have a reliable pivot away from Caleb Williams, and I'm gonna be playing those guys until I see Caleb start to develop a little bit more. Um, but in this matchup, I would play DJ Moore because Roma Dunes uh, is banged up. So is Keenan Allen. I think DJ Moore is going to end up just being kind of the de facto uh, receiving option. I don't like DeAndre Swift, 
But if you have them, you can play them here. But that's about it. And then uh, the last game of the week, the Monday Nighter, Falcons at Eagles, 47 and a half point over under. Uh, I think there's going to be another rough outing for the Falcons passing game. The Eagles front seven is tremendous. They are going to be able to get after Kirk Cousins the same way that the Pittsburgh Steelers were. And that is not going to bode well for this passing game. So I would be fading Drake London again this week if, if possible. Probably not. It's probably not possible. You're going to have to just throw him in and hope he doesn't get you another dud. Uh, I think Kyle Pitts is going to be viable week in and week out because of the way that the offense is constructed now. Um, apologies. Now I'm forgetting the name. Uh, literally was just, oh, it was on uh, Tuesday. Shout out to HooveTube and Dustin, uh, Dusty Dog, and uh Joel Worth, that's what it was. It was Joel who said that Kyle Pitts had a 100% route participation as a tight end, which is fucking insane. So Kyle Pitts is in your lineup. Bijan, again, Bijan's floor is what we saw last week against the Steelers, and it was still like 15 fantasy points. It's going to be rough for the first chunk of the season because the Falcons actually have a lot of difficult matchups but then it gets way easier for the rest of the season. So make sure that you are holding on to your Falcons players, even if they're underperforming a little bit right now. This first chunk of four or five games of the season is really difficult. They will get better as the season goes on. Uh, and then on the Eagles side, again, you're just – this is you're starting everybody. Even Dallas Goddard was involved. Um, so, yeah, you're starting A.J. Brown, obviously, Devonta Smith, Saquon Barkley, Jalen Hurts, and Dallas Goddard. There's your five-pack for the Eagles, and they are just in your lineup week in and week out, barring injury. All right, uh, we'll hit some streamers, and then we'll get on out of here. Don't tell me. We're about to go over a huge waterfall. Yep. Sharp rocks at the bottom? Most likely. Bring it on. So our streaming defenses of the week, uh, the Houston Texans versus the Chicago Bears. Um, we saw Caleb Williams struggle as a rookie. I think that those struggles will continue, especially when you remove Roma Dunes from this offense. I think the Houston Texans defense is underrated. They went from last to about middle of the pack last year. I think they will continue to improve. I think this could potentially be a bit of a danger game for the Chicago Bears, especially because this is in the Texans' building. Uh, Colts at Packers. Packers obviously are going to be forced to start Malik Willis. I do not believe in Malik Willis as a quarterback, and so I would be willing to start the Colts' defense, which is also an underrated group. And I had them as a streamer last week. I am sticking with the Seattle Seahawks against the New England Patriots. I think the Seahawks have a bit better of a run defense and can potentially contain Ramondre Stevenson. And even with Ramondre Stevenson's big game, the Patriots scored all of 16 points last week. So I think kind of no matter what, uh, this is a safe matchup to get you 8 to 10 points, but theoretically and potentially could end up uh, producing even more. And then for streaming kickers, we have Chris Boswell of the Pittsburgh Steelers. He was our entire offense last week. It was hilarious. He had like six field goals. Uh, the matchup this week against the Denver Broncos in mile high, perfect condition still for a kicker. Uh, so I think Boswell will definitely get uh, another couple of long bomb kicks here. Uh, I could project him easily to have – uh, at least three field goals in this game. So he's going to be one of the hot ads off the waivers and should be in lineups. Uh, I also like Chase McLaughlin uh, for Tampa Bay. He had a really good first week, solid outing, and they will be playing against Detroit in the Dome. So, again, very favorable conditions for kicker. And Blake Groupie, uh, the, the fantasy football groupie uh, for New Orleans Saints, uh, he will be playing against Dallas. Again, a little bit of a tougher defense, so potentially more opportunities for field goals because uh, I do think that the Saints, you know, with the Alvin Kamaras of the world can get close enough to kick some field goals. Um, and uh, maybe we see a little bit more work from Groupie, but 
he's also a good season long ad because I think that the Saints offense will be a little bit better than people expected and therefore we'll have a little bit more opportunity for kicking field goals. So groupie should be a nice little ad if you're in need of a kicker. That is it for me today. Uh, yeah, I did a pre-record today because uh, tonight I will be recording a worst interview. Uh, if you're not familiar, the worst interview show, those go up every Wednesday morning at 8 a.m. They're awesome interviews with other content creators in the fantasy football space. I ask them a bunch of weird ass questions and we usually just shoot the shit and have some fun. Those are my favorite episodes that I get to do. So if you have not already checked those out, uh, you can find them on YouTube and they're even available on uh, Apple Podcasts nowadays, um, as well as this show, Where's Fantasy Show. We'll be back with you on Sunday morning at 9 a.m. We're doing the Sunday morning live streams again this year, all year up until week 17 championship week of fantasy football. So you can come in Sunday morning at 9 a.m., ask me anything you want. Uh, it doesn't have to be football related, but for the most part, uh, people are coming in asking their start sit questions, trade questions, uh, last minute lineup questions, that kind of thing. Uh, so it's always a good time Sunday mornings, and I like to hit them real early at 9 a.m. So you can come uh, early bird doth get the worm. So you guys can come hang out. Uh, but thank you so much for watching this show. I hope that it helps you win your fantasy football matchups. And uh, make sure that you super kick that subscribe and like button. But until the next time. I'll catch all of you guys on the flip side. He's running down the middle by the 50. He's at the 30. He's bare chested and banging his chest. Now he runs the opposite way. He runs at the 50. He runs at the 40. The guy is drunk, but there he goes. The 20. They're chasing him. They're not going to get him. Waving his arms, bare chested. Somebody stop Look that out. man. Here comes